Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And thank you very much also for the very, very kind invitation. It's really, really appreciated. So the main research activity that uh, um, I'm currently performing aims at the manipulation of the macroscopic magnetic order in solids on the femtosecond time scale. The relevance of this research direction becomes clear if we consider different time scales of spin dynamics from two different perspectives, science and technology. For instance, if we consider nanosecond spin dynamics, then we walk on a very safe ground because we can rely on the concept of equilibrium and therefore we can rely on thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is a fantastic theory because the predictions of thermodynamics are very robust within the framework of validity of the theory itself. Maybe that's one of the reasons why nanosecond spin dynamics is already employed in technology nowadays. Now, the situation vastly differs if we start to consider shorter and shorter time scales of spin dynamics, picosecond down to the femtosecond regime, simply because here there is no well established theory. And for an experimentalist like me, this is something really exciting because the observation that we perform in the lab can sometimes really defy our understanding of magnetism. For instance, in the last few years, we have been learning that changing just slightly the excitations of condition of a magnetic material, we can either induce a classical regime of spin dynamics, fully describable in terms of classical equation of motion, or induce a purely quantum mechanical regime of spin dynamics with no classical counterpart. The proper experimental tool to investigate this time scale is a femtosecond laser pulse. Now, this research area is almost entirely fundamental. If somebody wants to claim that it might be relevant technologically, first of all, some challenges must be met. Clearly, we must be able to control magnetism on this time scale in a reproducible way, in a robust way, and minimizing the energy dissipations as much as possible. That's what several of our colleagues are working on. However, there is one more thing that so far has almost entirely been neglected. The femtosecond spin dynamics must be coupled to charges. Otherwise, any possible future concept of femtosecond magnetic technology, information technology, can never be coupled to present day CMOS technology. From the fundamental side, the coupling between speed and charges on the femtosecond time scale is largely unexplored. The materials that typically we use are dielectric or semiconductive antiferromagnets. So there, is, there are no free electrons and therefore no joule heating, and the materials are antiferromagnets. So the spin dynamics is here intrinsically by nature dramatically faster than in a ferromagnet, and that's why we really want to study antiferromagnets. When I use the word antiferromagnet, I refer to the easiest possible antiferromagnetic structure, comprising two collinear sublattices coupled by the exchange interaction. The sublattices are equivalent, so the total spin of the system and the total magnetization vanish. We have to introduce another quantity as order parameter, and typically we introduce the nail vector or antiferromagnetic vector L, which is defined as the vectorial difference of the two sublattices. So it's this blue arrow here. Uh, sometimes this is indicated also with the letter N, especially by theorists. However, I'm talking about shooting laser pulses on magnetic materials. So I am not aiming at characterizing the ground state. I'm aiming at excited states. In particular, if you start to consider all the possible magnetic excitation of such a system, you come across very natural the concept of magnon. A magnon or a spin wave is in essence a perturbation of the magnetic ground state generated by a spin flip process, delta S equal one. You can induce a magnon typically either relying on a magnetic field or by means of the spin orbit coupling. For the purpose of my talk today, the two words spin wave and magnets are interchangeable. And today we are discussing solids. So if you want to consider and describe in a compact way all possible spin wave modes or magnum modes of a specific solid, what you can do is to use the dispersion relation of magnets, exactly like you would do for phonons.
This is the typical shape of the dispersion relation of Magnus in an antiferromagnet. I would like to point out that the wave vector scale here represents the entire Brillouin zone. So on this wave vector scale, the wave vector of light is basically zero. So optically, most likely you are going to address K0 Magnus, the Magnus with the lowest energy, the lowest frequency. So basically the magnetic resonances. The very first demonstration of impulsive excitation of these magnets with femtosecond laser pulses was reported back in 2005 by Alexei Kimmel when he showed that 100 femtosecond laser pulses can drive this coherent oscillation of the magnetization in a dielectric material, and you can control the phase of this oscillation changing the polarization of light. Microscopically, this phenomenon corresponds to generating coherent magnets. The mechanism of excitation in this case is impulsive stimulated drama scattering. I'm not going to discuss this today. If there are questions, I will be glad to take them. I just want to point out that we are talking about light scattering. Light is not absorbed, light is scattered. So the photon energy that you employ doesn't need to be resonant with any transition. It can be tuned to the transparency region of the material. Now, if you use this concept and you push it a little farther, you can even induce magnets at the center of the Brillouin zone in the total absence of heating of electrons and the lattice. And that's what back then we call zero dissipations regime. Alternatively, you can pump magnets by inducing selectively the proper phonon modes. And with proper, I mean phonon modes that induce a lattice distortion with the, distortion with the proper symmetry so that this distortion can couple two spins. Alternatively, some other things that you can try to do pumping K0 magnets is even reverse the magnetization in dielectric ferry magnets. Uh, this can be done on a time scale of 30 picosecond, even with a single laser pass as demonstrated in this rather recent paper. Moreover, this is something that uh, we actually found out very recently. It is possible in very thin film of garnet, thin, I mean, 70 nanometer thin garnets, it is possible to excite K0 magnets and to increase the frequency of the resonance up to 20% of the value because the laser pulses are inducing strain waves that modifies the anisotropy. And this is a concept that very recently we discussed and published together with the group of Stefano Bonetti, who works both in Stockholm and the University of Venice. Another approach to the excitation of magnets is the so-called resonant pumping. In this case, the magnetic field of light oscillates resonantly with the frequency of the magnets. And the magnetic field of light can apply a torque on the spins, generating macroscopic precession, which microscopically, again, means pumping magnets. Now, if you try to push the spin dynamic to shorter and shorter time scale, you would like to be able to address also magnets with higher frequencies. That's not always possible optically on this time scale, but in some cases we demonstrated that we can achieve these results because we can pump pairs of magnets with wave vector near the edges of the Brillouin zone via light scattering. So we can access an excited state in which the order parameter, the antiferromagnetic vector, oscillates coherently at a certain frequency given by the sum of the frequencies of the two magnets. So we could generate and control oscillations of the order parameter with a frequency of 22 terahertz. Considering these time scales and the wavelength of the magnets generating in this process, these observations suggested the possibility of performing quantum magnetics on extreme time and length scale. Why quantum? Quantum because if you pump magnets at the edges of the Brillouin zone, there is no way to derive a proper equation of motion for the spin system using classical or semi-classical models based on LLG or LLB equations, which is the case if you excite magnetic resonances. To describe the spin dynamics, we had to derive a fully quantum mechanical theory. This concept here opened up a lot of questions, some of which are not answered yet. And this is something I'm not going to discuss this further today, but this is something that is still going on. I think I gave you, uh, in my introduction, an overview of what you can do with laser pulses on dielectric magnetic materials. There are several open issues. I would like to discuss two of them today. First of all, it's about multi-domain states. 
Antiferromagnets are in nature present in multi-domain states. If you want to generate a single domain state, you need to apply a monster field that you can have only in a facility, typically 60, 70 Tesla. Uh, you cannot generate a single domain state easily with moderate fields like in ferromagnets. And it is not clear how multi-domain state affects the ultra-fast generation of magnets and the propagation of magnets. The concepts that I've discussed so far are well formulated for a single domain. And the second idea, which I have already mentioned very briefly, is the coupling between spin and charges. That's the concept to study. If we want to realize a spin to charge conversion on the femtosecond time scale, completely unrestrained from any limitation due to energy dissipation. So a completely coherent conversion of spin into charge dynamics. And if you know, or if you understand what the origin of the coupling is in the material on a microscopic level, you can even imagine to manipulate the coupling with laser pulses. And I'm, I'm referring to phenomena such as switching on and off arbitrarily the coupling between spin and charges with individual laser pulses. In this period, I would like to introduce a concept now, and I'm going to do so from the standpoint of an experimentalist. The concept is the so-called exitomagnon transition. Let me show you the absorption spectrum of a dielectric antiferromagnet, nickel oxide, one of the most famous dielectric antiferromagnets. This is the spectral range below the band gap. This feature appears in the spectrum, and it comprises a sharp peak A and a side band B. Such feature appears in the spectrum of many dielectric antiferromagnets. It's not just a nickel oxide story. And this feature was analyzed, it was observed long ago, and it was realized that A represents an electronic transition, spin forbidden electronic transition, so a delta S equal one electronic transition, which typically is forbidden in terms of electric dipole transition. And the sideband B was addressed and identified as a generation of a magnet. The reason for that lies in the data. The difference in energy between A and B matches the frequency of a magnet in nickel oxide at 10 Kelvin. If we increase the temperature, we observe that the difference in energy between A and B shifts. And it matches again the frequency of the same magnet mode in nickel oxide at the new value of temperature. Basically, if you plot the temperature dependence of the difference in frequency between A and B, you obtain the frequency, pardon, the temperature dependence of a magnet frequency. So this process, which is the exit of magnet, is canonically interpreted as composed by two simultaneous transitions, an electronic process with delta S equal one and a magnet, generation of a magnet, so that overall the spin conservation is restored. In nickel oxide, the magnet mode that is involved here is a magnet at the center of the Brillouin zone. But in other materials, it is possible that high energy magnets are involved. For instance, in copper metaborate, there is an exit magnet in which high energy magnets are involved. So you have the unique opportunity to resonantly pump high energy magnets. I'm saying that it's unique because the wave vector of these magnets is huge and the wave vector of light is zero. We managed to realize an excitation of magnet pairs with huge wave vector k and minus k so that the wave vector is conserved. But in the case of the exit of magnet, we can pump resonantly individual magnets, perturbing the magnetic system on the shortest possible time scale. These are the highest frequencies here. Copper metaborate is a complicated material. For what I have to tell you today, you need to know only one thing about this compound. In the phase diagram, there are two magnetic phases and the two magnetic phases are not separated by a structure of phase transition. The phase transition is only magnetic. We have an antiferromagnetic phase and then a weak ferromagnetic phase. The idea of the experiment was really easy and straightforward. Just cooling down the material below the phase boundary, pumping resonantly a lot of magnets at the edges of the Brillouin zone and understanding if this excitation perturbs the magnetic system strongly enough to drive the phase transition. And it turned out to be the case. We could drive the phase transition in 600 femtoseconds, and the new phase lives on a much longer time scale, up to nanoseconds for sure. But we, we estimated that it's, it is there up to milliseconds or microseconds, pardon, or tens of microseconds. There is another thing that you can do with exit of magnet, which is a bit more elegant. And the other thing is about nickel oxide. 
More than 10 years ago, we learned from uh, Professor Takuya Sato that in nickel oxide, we can optically induce and detect two different magnum modes, a terahertz magnum mode corresponding to this fast oscillation and the slower 110 gigahertz mode corresponding to the slower oscillations. Only the terahertz mode is reporting to be involved in the exciton magnum. So again, the idea of the experiment is very simple. We want to be able to tune the photon energy of our laser pulses in the spectral range relevant so that we can resonantly and off resonantly pump the exciton magnum. Because what we would like to understand is whether it is possible to selectively amplify only one of the two magnum modes. In the experiment that we perform, I am going to show you just a few pump probe traces taken for different photon energies in this spectral range. In every data set, you can recognize a slow oscillation, frequency of 130 gigahertz, consistent with the low frequency mode. In some cases, like in this one, you can observe a faster ripple on top of the data. It is way more easy and also way more clear to look at the data from the frequency domain. So uh, I'm going to fully transform the, uh, this data set here, which is very smooth. And in the case of this data set, 0.92 electron volt, we don't see any terahertz frequency component in the data. We only have one oscillations here at gigahertz frequency. But in the case of the 0.97 electron volt data set, this faster ripple corresponds to a frequency component of 1.07 terahertz, which is the frequency of the high frequency mode. So now, for every photon energy that we measure, and we measure for many more photon energies, we can extrapolate the amplitude of the two frequency components of the signal. And we can plot them as a function of the excitation energy so that we have the entire spectral dependence of the high frequency mode in blue and of the, green, of the low frequency mode in green. I'm also showing here the absorption spectrum of the material for the sake of discussion. If we pump fully off resonant, we don't see terahertz magnums. Okay, if we pump resonantly, we see the strongest signal in terms of high frequency magnums. The resonance is narrow. We see strong signal on a broader spectral range because our laser pulses are uh, femtosecond, so ultra short, which means that intrinsically they're broadband. And the width of this blue box is exactly quantitatively the bandwidth of our laser pulses. So basically we observe this feature convolve for uh, with the Gaussian with this bandwidth. We can increase even more the photon energy. And in so doing, we still have terahertz magnus, but with reduced amplitude. And the reason for this is that we are pumping the phonon sidebands. If you pump phonon sidebands of an excitonic transition, you are still pumping the exciton in the end, but you also involve in the process the lattice. So some photons of the pump are absorbed and goes into the lattice, and that's why the excitation is less efficient. And again, if we pump off resonant on the other side, we see nothing. Okay, this is really straightforward. So we can follow the profile of the resonance and amplify the terahertz magnum. It is fine. It's a resonant drive. It is not a purely dissipative mechanism. It is not true that the stronger the absorption, so the more we heat up the material, and the stronger the magnetic signal. Because if we look at the data and correspondence of the highest value of the absorption spectrum here, we are pumping the material generating the maximum laser heating. This does not correspond to the maximum signal. This gives a signal which is roughly 60% of the maximum. So it is a resonant drive. What is important is not the total absorption, but the nature of the transition. We have to pump the exciton magnum to see terahertz magnum. Fine. What is not fine is the low frequency mode. This mode is amplified as well, which should not be the case because in the literature, it is shown that if you take a dielectric material and you pump with different photon energies below the band gap, you always su succeed in observing coherent magnets, but the amplitude of these oscillations does not depend on the wavelength as long as you are below the band gap, which clearly is not the case in our experiment. So the first, a, a possible scenario that we took into account is that also the low frequency mode is involved in the exit of magnet transition. This cannot be the case because the terahertz magnet and the electron transition share the same symmetry, while the other magnet mode 
has a completely different symmetry, so it cannot be coupled to the external transition. The second proposition was that we pump a magnum mode and by interaction with the phonons, this can couple to another magnum mode. This cannot take place in our case because there are no phonons in this material with the proper wave vector and frequency for the frequency mixing that we observe in the data. So we have to take into account a very basic feature of our sample. It's in a multi-domain state. In nickel oxide, there are several kinds of domains. Only the so-called T domains are relevant for optical experiments. A T domain looks more or less like this. Like this. So the antiferromagnetic vector has a certain equilibrium orientation in one domain. In the wall, it rotates towards the equilibrium orientation in the other domain. At the center of the wall, from the two sides of the two domains, the antiferromagnetic vector is parallel to each other. Now, I would like to show you the mechanism that we think could explain our results. First of all, in terms of a cartoon. We do pump in one domain, the high frequency magnets, because we pump the resonance. Okay. This mode has a very particular um, trajectory of oscillation. So it's completely out of plane. Now, magnets can propagate and interact with the wall, setting the wall into motion. If you solve the equation of motions for the wall, you find a very rich spectrum. Out of all possible solutions, there are some localized solutions, not propagating, which I am representing here as a distortion of the wall. So in this solution, spins in the wall are in motion, and they can couple to the spins in the domain T2 by exchange interaction. And this can generate dynamics of the spins in the domain T2. In particular, it can generate also the low frequency mode. That's just a sketch, a cartoon. We can be clearly more rigorous and formal. We can write down the spin dynamics induced pumping magnets in the domain T1. This is the dynamics of the order parameter. And then we can plug this term as source term for the spin dynamics in the domain T2. Here we use the most general form of the equation of motion for the order parameter in antiferromagnets. And then we decompose the equation and we have three different equations of motions for the domain T2 where we have the amplitude of the oscillation of the domain wall, the amplitude of the oscillation corresponding to the high frequency magnet, and what we really care about, the amplitude of the oscillation corresponding to the low frequency magnet. For all these three equations of motion, the source term is the photoinduced magnet in the domain T1. If you solve that for the low frequency mode, we find that this is a function of the amplitude of the high frequency mode photoinduced in the domain T1. All the details of the theory have been published in this paper. And we consider here also other regimes. So the role of domain walls in magnetoelastic antiferromagnets for linear spin dynamics, nonlinear spin dynamics, and not only ultrafast spin dynamics, but also slower time scales. Now, I show you a sketch. I show a couple of equations describing more or less what the approach of the theory is. Now we have to understand if this mechanism can really be responsible for the observation. So ideally, we should repeat our experiment in a purely single domain state nickel oxide sample. As I've already mentioned, it's really not easy to generate a single domain state of the entire sample. What we could do, to be more precise, what our collaborators, Takuya Sato, was able to do is a, a, an annealing process of the sample, which results in making the domains bigger, so big that we can, first of all, see them with a microscope, and then so big that we can focus our light beam entirely in a single domain. So effectively, we can reproduce the, the experiments in a single domain, although it is not true that the entire sample is in a single domain state. Doing that, we expect it to be able to amplify the frequency mode simply because of the resonance, and we expect it to be able to not amplify the low frequency mode. Our idea and our mechanism suggest that if there are no walls, there, are, there is no way to couple the high frequency mode to the low frequency mode. There is no way to amplify the gigahertz magnets. And repeating the experiment, that's exactly what we observed. We could amplify the high frequency mode following the profile of the transition, like in the previous case. And there is no way to see any amplification of the low frequency mode simply because it's not amplified. There are no walls no amplification, which confirms our claim. In conclusion, our experiment shows that the domain walls 
in an antiferromagnet are not simply a problem, an interest, a noisance that you would like to get rid of. They can also enable some functionalities in the materials, as in this case, a particular coupling between different magnomos in a nonlinear regime of spin dynamics. Moreover, if you consider this hybrid excitation between spin and charges, you can drive magnetic field transition and amplify magnum modes. All the things that I discussed today could have never been achieved by myself alone. I was lucky enough to be able to work with a lot of unbelievable people whose names are reported here on my slides and also very lucky to receive uh, support from funding agencies. And with this, I would like to conclude my talk and thanking all of you for your kind attention.